leadership team. Um, children in the fifth grade on down, you're dismissed to go downstairs along with the teachers. Um, that song is really more than a song. It's a prayer, isn't it? It's, it's Lord, prepare us, right? Prepare our hearts, prepare our minds to receive from you that which you have for us this morning. And boy, if we could uh, pray that each time we gather, what a powerful work God would do in us and through us. I'm excited to see just how he's going to answer that prayer this morning as we gather. So I'm going to invite you to bow with me and we're going to pray and give thanks to God as he, and just in, in, in faith that he will answer. And we want to pray for our children as well, God, as they go downstairs and, and thank you for the joy that is ours that we can gather here this morning, the, the pleasure that is ours to be able to gather with God's people in in worship and in instruction from your word. We need you to answer that prayer for all of us, for the children as they go downstairs, really for ourselves, God, that you would speak to us um, through your word, through your servant, through, through the singing. God, we believe and depend on that. We believe that you speak through your word. And that when your people gather under the power of it, we are transformed. And so do the work in us that you desire to do this morning, O Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to encourage you that we are going to be, uh, one of the announcements that we didn't do this morning, because I wanted to do it, is remind us of the fall carnival that's coming up at the end of October, that there's going to be a sign-up for that as well. And many of you have done different things in the past that are uh, roles and positions that you've done. And if you're interested in doing that, please contact or just sign up for that. Um, and if you're new here in the last couple years, you don't know what a full fall carnival looks like. You know that in the last two years, we've kind of, on, on Halloween night, we lined this sidewalk over here and tried to do what we could to bless all the people that are out that night already. Um, but before COVID, we used to fill the whole parking lot with games and activities, horse rides and bounce houses and food and all kinds of just neat things to be able to really uh, bless the community and just let them know that we love them. And we, want, we are excited that we're going to be able to get back to that kind of event this year. And so you know that we have about a month and a half, and we're planning and preparing for it, and we're inviting you to join us as we try to bless this community. And it's a wonderful uh, opportunity. Last year, even with the what I'd call the edited version, we were able to minister and love uh, to about 900 to 1,000 people. It's pretty significant, the amount of people that we're able to to have contact with and that's really the point of it so i want to invite you for this morning though to open your bibles with me uh to luke there's actually two passages i'll give you the the second one first because it comes first in your bible in matthew chapter 25 uh, it's on page 944 if you want to use the pew bible in the rack in front of you and then maybe you just put something in your bible to hold that spot, and then turn over to the, the third gospel, Matthew being the first gospel in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, then Luke. Turn to Luke chapter 6, and we're going to be looking at a passage there in a little bit as well, and that one's page 1033. Uh, there, we're, we're looking at a number of different passages this morning, um, but I just want to start with this, this picture. I want to help us understand a little bit about where we're headed this morning. On December 3rd, December 3rd, 2020. So we're, we're talking right in the middle of that first year of COVID. One customer, one customer at a Dairy Queen in Minnesota sparked a whole community to give the gift that keeps on giving or at least it kept on giving, for two and a half days. The drive-through customer 
at the Dairy Queen managed to continue a chain of paying it forward by paying for the car behind them. When they went to the window and they made, paid for their order, they said, oh, I'd like to cover the car behind me as well. And by doing that, it sparked this paying it forward for over 900 cars. That's crazy. Lasting two and a half days. When the store closed the first night, the last person in line gave them $10 for the first person in line the next morning. This is pretty cool. So that car left that $10 in the chain again, started that morning, and the same person the second night did it, and over 900 customers participated in this act of kindness, totaling more than $10,000. That was pretty crazy. Here's where we're going for today, all right? We're not going to Dairy Queen. There's not one nearby. And I'm not even going to ask you to, you know, like pay for the car behind you. That would just be too cheesy. But for Christ followers, for those who identify as Christians, a strong <laughs> indication that you are walking in that, that you are walking what we are learning to be a spirit-filled life, that you have the Spirit of God in you, is that you are kind. Now, immediately we're faced with a little bit of a dilemma. Because uh, the dilemma of defining kindness accurately, right? I mean, we can, we can you know, define it in lots of ways. But I mean, if, if kindness is measured by how nice we are to the people in our lives that we like, then everyone is kind, and we really have no need to do this. Thank you very much. Let's go home. We'll find something to do with our time. But in its most elementary, basic understanding, I think I have this first comment up on a slide. Kindness is simply showing mercy and compassion expecting nothing in return, which separates it from just being nice to everybody we like, right? Showing mercy and compassion and expecting nothing in return. It's doing for those who cannot repay us. That's an act, if you will, of kindness. When we do for those who cannot repay us and, and, and not needing or wanting any recognition, Right? I mean, that's another thing that kind of separates it from an act of, you know, whatever, is that I don't need any recognition. I don't need anybody to notice that I did it. I don't need a claim for either myself or my cause. You know, it's, it would be like if we were doing this fall carnival and we were just shouted from the rooftops, hey, I just want you to know we're being kind. Christ Community Church loves you. Don't you notice how great we are? you like, that would... I don't think we would have five people come back next year. And, and they shouldn't, right? The biblical understanding of the word kindness, the biblical word, is actually uh, defined this way. It's defined as zeal, zealousness for another's good. Zeal for another's good. You are anxious in trying to find ways to bless. That's the biblical understanding. And, and really, the anchor point, the thing that roots this in Christ's followers, that separates us from anything else, any, the anchor point for this kind of kindness that, that separates is because, here, listen to this, because we have come to understand that we are the recipients of the greatest and most undeserved kindness ever in Christ Jesus. That's our anchor. That's our grounding point. So in one sense, if we were to just stand here this morning and all I said or all you heard was, be kind, or be more kind. 
that would be a shame if that's all we heard. Because really, in, in one sense, you don't need to know God or to be a Christian, Christ follower, to be kind, right? I mean, we'd just be honest with that. But what I hope we hear this morning is this. Bask in the kindness that God has shown you through the Lord Jesus Christ. Let it wash over you. Let his kindness towards you wash over you. And you will likely never need to be told, be kind ever again. Right? Our mom and dads tell us, you know, when we're growing up, especially when it comes to our siblings, like, be kind. Right? I'm hoping that by the time we're done here this morning, as we are refreshed and bask in and allow the love of God, his kindness towards us, wash over us, that it will ground us in such a way that we'll never have to be told to be kind. We're kind because of the kindness that's been shown us in Christ Jesus by God himself. God's kindness is the very definition of zeal for someone's good. Look at Titus. It's, it's, it's going to be on the screen. It's not the passage that I want us to turn to, but at one time, you know, Titus says, at one time, Paul says to him, we too were foolish and disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating everyone. And you think, surely that's overstated. What, what, a, what a verdict on the human condition apart from Christ. Now, what that does not say, it doesn't say that people are as bad or as mean as they could be. It just shows that we're not what we were designed to be in Christ because of sin in our lives. At one time, we were foolish and disobedient, deceived and enslaved. In one way or another, we gave in to our, our personal, our self-passions and pleasures, which is, of course, the opposite of kindness when we are trying to be kind to ourselves that's the point it sounds dark but the reality of what he's saying is before you knew the kindness of god your only concern was really being kind to yourself look at that way he goes but verse four but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared. He saved us. Not because of our good deeds, our righteous things that we've done, but because of his mercy. That's another word, loving kindness. His, his kindness towards us. Because of his kindness, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So the, the right way to consider as we're Thinking through kindness is this, and maybe it's the next slide. Kindness is that undeserved compassion in action. So kindness isn't a thought process only. It's compassion with feet. Compassion with feet. And when we think about mercy and compassion, it's the right way to look at it. And in the awesome thing as i was discovering this and thinking through this in a fuller way it it that it delights god think about this for a minute it delights god to express his kindness towards us i want to show you a passage of scripture in jeremiah an old testament passage that according to god in his word he declares that he delights to show us his kindness this is verse 23 of chapter 9 this is what the Lord says, let not the wise person boast in their wisdom or the strong boast in their strength or the rich boast in their riches. You can have all three of those things. 
But what are we to marvel at? But let the one who boasts, boast about this. That they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who, listen to how he defines himself here, who shows kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. And it delights me. That God is delighted to express his kindness towards us. That he takes pleasure in it. It's a pretty neat thing to just let set in your mind. See, as Christ's followers then, oh, what does this mean? It means that we're, we're, we're kind, if you will, because that's our experience from God. Our experience. And, and as we've been considering the overarching passage of Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 to 26, which is the command to walk by the Spirit, uh, that power of God that's now at work in Christ followers. Remember that passage in Galatians chapter 5, chapter 5, verse 16 to 26, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. And then he goes on to list what the evidences of are of the flesh but then he finishes that passage by reminding us of what the evidences are of walking by the Holy Spirit, that power of God at work in every believer. And then he says the fruit or evidence of walking by God's Spirit is that you display the same fruit of Christ uh, or the same evidence and same life. As, and so he says they are what? So I say walk by the Spirit, for the fruit of the Spirit is, by now we ought to be able to almost repeat them out loud together. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. We'll stop there for now. We'll get to the other four in the next few weeks. But kindness is something that is implanted in us by the Holy Spirit, the power of God. Because we've, as we recognize, we come to see that not only have we received kindness from God by Jesus Christ, but that also by His Spirit, it's, kindness has been, we've been using this word sown into us, or planted, you know, brought and implanted in the Christ follower, which is enabling us towards God-glorifying, Christ-exalting kindness which is so different than self-exalting kindness. It's who we've been remade or are being remade to, to be, not to do. All right? So kindness isn't one of those things that we can check off a list as though somehow I did my act of kindness today, as though paying for the car behind me was my good deed for the day. It's something I did. No. If we think that, we've got, it, we've got it wrong. Because what the Holy Spirit is doing in us is He's making us these ways. He's remaking us from being those who try to act kindly towards themselves to those who are kind towards others first. And so this is where it gets a, a, a little bit sticky. It's where it gets a little bit uncomfortable. When we make this well-rounded search of kindness in the Bible, it seems that there is a certain sense where God's kindness towards us is actually conditional. I know that we don't like the idea of something that God would do as conditional. You know, God loves unconditional, so, <coughs> excuse me, therefore his kindness must be unconditional. But I want you to think this through with me, and let's look at this passage in Romans chapter 11. It's up here. And he says, Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who reject him or fell. That's the point of that. 
but the kindness of God to you provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you will be cut off. That's like, I don't know about you, but that makes me a little bit uncomfortable. It's, now, there's two places where we read things like this, and the first is in Matthew's gospel that we're, we're going to turn there a different later, where he says, forgive as you've been forgiven. And those, if you don't forgive, then you can pretty much count on the fact that I will not forgive you. And then here, kindness is in us. We have to choose to walk in it, you know, that's that Galatians 5 passage. So I say, walk in the Spirit. Or as he puts it in another way to another group of people, the church of Colossae, where Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, he says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And so what we are seeing is it's the evidence of your claim. We claim to be in Christ. We claim to be Christians. Does our walk prove it out? Not that we do an act of kindness, but would people be able to identify us as increasingly more kind? On June 15th, 2015, Dylan Ruth, uh, you might not remember that name now, but in June of 2015, that name would have been huge. Dylan entered the Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina, and murdered nine people gathered there for a Bible study. The families of those nine people that were murdered, gathered in the courtroom where Dylan is going to be arraigned, brought up on charges. And at the hearing, the judge gave each one of them an opportunity, if they desired, to address Dylan Ruth, who wasn't in the courtroom, but there by television in a room because they were afraid of what might happen, what they might do to him. But the judge wanted to give every family at the arraignment an opportunity. Most of them took the opportunity. They all didn't speak, but each one who spoke issued this statement. And their statement wasn't at all what was to be expected. They were ex the, the, the court and, and the, the guards were ready for something they didn't even want him there for because they were afraid of the anger and violence that could erupt against him. But their statements were not what they expected. They were statements of compassion and mercy and kindness. Instead of responding with hate, the black community in Charleston responded with words of kindness. Theirs were voices of mercy and forgiveness. One by one, they stood and looked at him and said, I miss my loved one desperately, but I do not hate you. I forgive you. One by one, those who stood prayed for that person. I wonder what the people that were gathered at the AME church, remember they were gathering for a Bible study? I wonder what passage they were studying that night when Dylan came in and unloaded on them. I wonder if it was the passage that I want to call your attention to now in Luke chapter 6. Would you turn there? We don't know the passage they were studying because they were all killed. But is it possible that they were reading this passage but I say to you, who have ears to hear. It says, but I say to you who hear, 
But the implication is, if you will listen, Jesus says this to you. If you will listen, love your enemies. Do those, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other cheek as well. And from the one who wants to take your cloak or your coat, give him your shirt as well. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from the one who takes away your goods, don't demand them back. And as you wish what others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, to what credit is that? What benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. In other words, you don't need to be a Christian to do these things. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And the, you will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Love, He says, do good, bless, pray, give. Sound like wonderful, godly, Christian things to do until we hear who He tells us to do it to. Love your enemy. Do good to the one who hates you. Bless the one who curses you. Pray for your abuser. Give to everyone who asks of you. And as I want to be careful and handle this rightly, this does not mean stay in an abusive situation where you are being harmed. That's not what it's saying. Kindness is being merciful. I think that's our next slide because we want to unpack what this looks like. Kindness is being merciful then. Because mercy is what? It's not giving what they deserve. That's what we saw in verses 27 to 29 of that passage. It means kindness is costly. Write that down and underline it. Kindness is costly. Do you get that? I, that's hard. I'm fine with being kind as long as it doesn't cost me anything. But kindness is costly. Remember last week my confession about hating traffic, right? I mean, I hate, and I still don't like it any more than I did last week. And I still hate long lines at the checkout. But the kind person allows that person who's going on the, the, the shoulder of the road to bypass that merging 15 lanes into one lane because of construction. And when you see that guy do that, you want to pop their tires I, do, I mean, I do. I didn't say, did I say you do? I do. <laughs> I'm going to watch you let them in line in front of you so I can learn from your kindness. I'm going to watch you slow down a little bit and open that gap intentionally for that car. I'm going to watch you because I'm struggling to let the person in line at the grocery store in front of me. But I'm going to watch you do that. You say, oh, no, 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 it's all right, great. Come on over. And, and not, not begrudgingly, not like, I am so good. <laughs> like, watch this, and then come and tell everybody about it, right? Kindness. Those are fun examples, maybe, of mercy. But it's not just merciful, it's actually compassionate. It's, see, mercy is not giving what they deserve. We would use the word grace, but kindness is being compassionate. It's actually giving somebody what they don't deserve. That's, this is hard. Can we be honest? This is hard. I don't like this. 
It's giving them what they don't deserve. You love your enemies. You do good to those who hate you. You bless those who curse you. You pray for those who abuse you. You stand in a courtroom and you say, I love you to the person who shot your mother and mean it. Kindness is merciful. Kindness is compassionate. And kindness is also vulnerable. It's being vulnerable. It's allowing yourself to be taken advantage of. I'm not going to be a doormat. How many times have we ever said that? And there's some nuance to this. We just talked about abusing, right? But at the same time, if we go back to our chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians where we see an amazing definition of love, it doesn't keep a record of wrongs, so it doesn't remember that we were wronged before. And so we're willing to be vulnerable in light of that. And this warning needs to be said that the fear of being taken advantage of stops us from kindness a lot, right? The fear of being taken advantage of stops us, and we need to say, no, I'm not going to let it. I'm not going to let it stop me. See, Jesus touched and healed lepers and and dined with sinners and showed compassion to sick. And he forgave those who hurt him. So our Savior, who expresses kindness to us, also shows kindness. It was, this is not some abstract idea meant for enlightened people. It's meant to be ours. And so kindness is being merciful, it's being compassionate, it's being vulnerable, and it's maybe this, above all things, it's giving whatever resources we have in order to meet the needs of another. Kindness is giving whatever resources we have. And this is where I want you to turn to the other passage I called your attention to in Matthew chapter 25. And because this is another one of those passages, if we're going to be honest, there are so many passages in the Bible that we don't like. There are so many passages in the Bible that we love. And then there are those passages in the Bible that make us really uncomfortable. And we don't know what to do with them. And this is one of those passages. When the Son of Man, Jesus, comes in His glory. This is talking about this whole chapter of Matthew, chapter 25, He's been building up to going to the cross. And so in building up to going to the cross, he's also warning them that there is coming a day when he will return. The Son of God who came once in glory as a baby will come once again in glory as the judge. And for some, Matthew chapter 25, for some, it'll be the greatest day ever. And for others, it'll be the worst day ever. He's been leading up to the reality that he's coming again. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he's going to sit on his glorious throne. And before him are going to be gathered all the nations. And he's going to separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he's going to place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And the king, Jesus, will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And the righteous will rightly answer him, I I don't recall seeing you, Jesus, hungry 
and feeding you. I don't recall seeing you thirsty and giving you a drink. When did we see you a stranger and welcome you? Or when did we see you, Jesus, naked and clothe you? And when did we see you, Jesus, sick or in prison and visit you? And he's going to simply say this. Verse 40, the very last verse. Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. As you did it to those who didn't deserve it and to those who couldn't repay you, it was as though you did it to me. Now, we look at this passage and we get our undies in a bunch, get all unnecessarily concerned that somehow Jesus is going to let people into his kingdom based on their works. That's a works-based faith. Take it up with Jesus, all right? <laughs> Just take it up with Jesus. Because that interpretation misses the point altogether. It's a self-justifying interpretation. The point isn't that being kind is going to get you into heaven. That's not the point that he's trying to make for us. The point is that those who are truly God's people, those who have confessed Jesus and are walking, are kind. And you can tell it by their good works, by their good deeds, not their good theology. Now, should we have good theology? Of course we should. We know that we're not saved by works. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us this very clearly. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It's not your own doing, it's the gift of God, not the result of works, so that nobody can boast. Remember, we looked at the Jeremiah passage. If you're going to boast, what do you boast in? The kindness of God. You boast in the kindness of God. We don't boast in what we did to get somehow God's favor. No, we can't. But verse 10 does go on to say, we have been created in Christ Jesus for good works. We've been created in Christ Jesus for good works. And we could go to James chapter 2. And we could look at a, a large chunk, but let's just concentrate on Chapter 2, verse 14. What good is it, James says? He says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, doesn't this sound really familiar? And one of you says to him, oh, go in peace, be warmed and filled. But we don't give them the things needed for the body. What what? What good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have kindness, is dead. It's not faith. That's the point. You have faith, someone says. And the other one says, yeah, but you have faith and I have works. And he's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> We're not going to play that game. You can't separate them. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. The way in which we care for the needy is a reflection of God's heart. Here's a challenge for you. Read the Bible. Genesis to Revelation. Everywhere from beginning to end, you are going to find that our God has compassion on the immigrant, on the sojourner, on the hungry, on the widow, on the orphan, on the poor, on the destitute, on the sinners, from beginning to end. The way in which we care for the needy is a reflection that we have God's love in our hearts. It's a reflection of our position as children. So in other words, it's an evidence of our salvation. It doesn't save us. It's the proof, if you will, in the pudding. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit working within us. 
Kindness is that daily reminder that we all belong to God and that we have uh, we, we, there's this response to his great love for us. Kindness is just that daily reminder that our resources are tools, in a sense, for him to bless other people in a way that shines his light and, and the love of Jesus Christ in the world. Luke 6, that passage that we read, love, do good, pray, bless, goes on to demonstrate just a little bit further in verse 38. One of the things that God does for his children who walk in this way. What he's going to say in this passage is going to say, the more you give away, the more I'll give you to give away. Pretty cool principle. Pretty cool principle. Verse 38 of chapter 6. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So it's like as you are giving with this hand, you're getting in this hand. And as you give, he gives so that you can keep giving. Test him in this. He loves a what? God loves a cheerful giver. <laughs> he loves a cheerful giver. So it's like open up your hands with what you have. That's kindness. Open up your hands instead of holding tightly. Open up your hands with what you have and let God use it to bless others. It's, you're not going to go without. He promises you that. You will not go without. If you are, He will bless you so that you can keep doing that. So as parents, we, we, you know, we want to raise kids who are super aware and sensitive to the needs around them. And we do that by modeling that. We're confident in our own skin and so thankful for our blessings. We just can't help but being kind. When we are kind, we glorify God and reflect His character. And by doing that, we show who we really belong to, that we are children of the King. As in the case of each of the fruit of the Spirit, though, one of the things that we just keep coming back to is it's a gospel issue. What do we mean by that? We've got to understand the beauty and kindness of God, our Savior, towards us. That's what motivates kindness. When we understand the gospel, that's what I mean when I say it's a gospel issue. It means we are the recipients of the greatest kindness ever through Christ Jesus. It invites you to receive the kindness of God. When you see his kindness towards us, it opens you up to saying, okay, Jesus, I want that. That's why it's a gospel issue. And so with that, I want to just invite us. We're going to pray. We're going to invite the worship team up. They're going to we're going to sing a couple of songs in a moment, but I just want to give us an opportunity to pause and let this word sink into our hearts. And I want to, we started with a, a, a moment of just quiet, and I want to give us a moment to do that again. And every time we gather here, because of his work, because of his indwelling spirit, we expect you, God, to work and move and teach to correct our hearts. To encourage us by your spirit. To remind us 
of the kindness you've shown us in Christ Jesus. To exhort us to walk in your spirit. To transform us from people who are concerned about being kind to themselves to being people who are kind because of the kindness that has been shown us. During that horn blasting, we also want to pray for the fire and DMS who are responding to a call. That's what that noise is. And ask God that you would keep them safe, care for them, also for those that they are going to help. And we don't know what the situation is, but we pray for them as well that your loving kindness would be poured into their situation now. Amen. Please join, stand and sing to the... <clears throat>